Hello and welcome to Mad About Superheroes review of X-Men 97. Marvel Productions really tried their best to spin off an X-Men cartoon series in the 1980s. The X-Men's guest appearances on Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends was definitely essential in finally getting a pilot off the ground in the late 80s. Although Marvel Productions would have to use the budget for the 13th episode of their RoboCop cartoon series to produce the Pride of the X-Men pilot. Though the 1989 pilot wasn't picked up to a full series, it did however pave the way for the highly regarded 90s X-Men the Animated Series. in which the X-Men battle the mutant menace of Magneto, Sabretooth, Apocalypse, and Mr. Sinister, among many others. The series would also adapt seminal X-Men comic book storylines as well, such as Days of Future Past, Weapon X, and the Dark Phoenix Saga, just to name a few. The show features X-Men similar to the look and lineup of the early 1990s X-Men drawn by Jim Lee, specifically the Blue Team established in the early issues of X-Men Volume 2. Composed of Cyclops, Wolverine, Rogue, Storm, Beast, Gambit, Jubilee, Jean Grey, Professor X, and Morph. X-Men 97 follows the same criteria as its predecessor, giving a unique spin of a classic tale told in the source material. The first installment, right off the bat, pays homage with the fanatical anti-mutant group Friends of Humanity, who have acquired and retrofitted Sentinel weaponry. The FOH have kidnapped a young mutant named Roberto da Custa, a.k.a. Sunspot, whose appearance here is reminiscent of his first appearance in the 80s New Mutants graphic novel, in which Roberto was also a kidnapped victim. The X-Men come to Roberto's rescue and make short work of the FOH. Then you are a fool. <laughs> the X-Men then set out to investigate the FOH, leading them to old foes such as Henry Gyrick and Bolivar Trask and eventually into an awesome battle with the Sentinels. The episode is capped off by the reveal that the presumed dead Professor X has left his wealth, his school for gifted youngsters, and the preservation of his dream of peaceful coexistence in the hands of his former friend turned foe and the X-Men's deadliest enemy, Magneto. I really like the inclusion of Bishop. I was heavily collecting comics when he made his first appearance in the X-Men comics during the 90s, and I still own the copy I picked up at my local comic shop way back in the day. Bishop's appearance in the original series are among some of my favorite episodes. I also like Morph's new look. It reminds me of the bounty hunters from the 80s movie Critters who were also shapeshifters. The inclusion of Sunspot is really cool also. The series has him holding back from using his powers. Can't wait to see his entire body transform when he finally uses his mutant ability. The animation is sleeker than the original, and I do like it, but the original fit in more with the hyper-stylized bombastic art of the 90s. The characterizations so far are definitely spot on and on par with the original series. It helps that almost all the original voice actors return to reprise their respective roles. In my humble opinion, the first episode excels at the action sequences, specifically the use of the X-Men's teamwork and the creative use of their powers collectively. Despite their personal disagreements or bickering at times, when the X-Men go into battle, they are united. The debut episode evenly balances paying homage to past events while keeping things moving forward. I'm really enjoying the series, and so far it's a worthy continuation of the beloved 90s X-Men the Animated Series. Magneto, now in charge of Xavier's school and his precious X-Men, makes a grand effort to prove his change of ideology and rescues both humans and mutants. 
Is that who I think it is? Saving humans? In the last episode, Scott and Jean were contemplating leaving the X-Men due to Jean's pregnancy. But they've decided to stick around due to their reluctance accepting their former foe's quick turnaround. The UN Armed Forces show up at Xavier's school and attempt to arrest Magneto for his past acts of terrorism against humanity. Magneto willingly surrenders and agrees to stand trial and prove himself. During his trial, the FOH attack and the supervillain Executioner wreaks havoc. The X-Men intervene, but Storm is depowered by Executioner's radiation blast. A shot that was meant for Magneto sends the Master of Magnetism into an uproar that had the potential to end in bloodshed. However, Magneto heeds the words of his best friend Xavier and shows mercy to his oppressors, opting to choose the example of peaceful coexistence and honor Xavier and the path led by the X-Men. Meanwhile, Jean goes into labor, and it's up to Wolverine to get her safely to the hospital. Careful, Logan! Get out the way! Get out of the way! When Scott arrives with Rogue at the hospital, the doctor isn't willing to uphold his Hippocratic Oath and deliver a mutant baby. So it's up to Rogue to absorb the doctor's ability to deliver Scott and Jean's son, Nathan, into the world. Without her powers, Storm decides to leave the X-Men. And while the team discusses her choice, they are interrupted by the sudden arrival of a woman needing their help. The mysterious woman is a dead ringer for Jean. This episode also hints at the former romantic relationship between Rogue and Magneto an element taken directly from the X-Men comics, a classic tale told in the Savage Land. This is the era I was heavily collecting comics, so I'm an easy mark for nods to that specific era. It's also why I'm such a big fan of the original cartoon series. The respect and reverence it has for its source material is absolutely endearing. Yet another nod is Magneto's costume change. Objectively, it's not the best look for the character. I would have preferred if they went with this version instead. It's more in line with the live-action version of Magneto. In the Marvel comics, Magneto would also try to live up to Xavier's dream in a similar fashion, by becoming the headmaster and mentor of Xavier's new mutants, who were eventually supposed to become the new X-Men. But when that went sideways and Cable took over, the new mutants became X-Force instead of the X-Men. I also like that Jubilee and Roberto, aka Sunspot, have their heart-to-heart -heart discussions in this location of the X-Mansion. It's the very same location Storm and Jubilee had their heart-to-hearts in Night of the Sentinels, the very first episode of X-Men the Animated Series. I also like that Magneto comes off as arrogant and still feels like a villain at times, but he's genuinely trying to live up to Xavier's dream, and he doesn't want to waste the potential of change his friend saw inside of him. Storm losing her powers was done to dramatic effect. Uh, the breeze is gone. I cannot feel it. What has he done to me? You really feel her loss, but I've read enough comics to know that it's not forever even though the episode led us to believe otherwise. It's also touching that Jean reaches out to Aurora in her time of despair. After all, what makes the X-Men great is their interpersonal relationships. Superhero action is fun, but what we connect to is the relatability of the characters, and the X-Men has had that going for it for a very long time. And X-Men 97 is keeping the tradition going strong. It's revealed that Jean's doppelganger is actually the real McCoy, leading Scott and the rest of the X-Men to wonder if they've been duped by an imposter. An apparition of the evil Mr. Sinister appears, informing Jean that she is in fact a clone. He created her with the purpose of using her and Scott's offspring, Nathan, to create an invincible being. By subjecting Nathan to a techno-virus, Sinister turns Jean's clone into the villainous Goblin Queen. Sire. They shall know my under mind control, she subjects the X-Men to nightmarish visions based on their individual fears. No, not you. Not again. Morph, who has a horrific past with Sinister, leads the X-Men to Sinister's lab. They find Nathan undergoing exposure to the virus. The real Jean Grey telepathically contacts the Goblin Queen and reconnects her to her family, the X-Men, using shared memories which ultimately breaks her free of Sinister's mind control. Let's go save Nathan. She and Scott then defeat Sinister and save their son. Unfortunately, Nathan is left gravely ill from this ordeal. The clone gene gives Nathan to the time-traveling bishop to bring him to a time and place in the future where there's a cure. Jean and her clone, who takes on the name Madeline Pryor, 
share a tender moment before Madeline leaves the team. The episode ends with a tease, when Storm meets a mutant named Forge who claims he can restore her powers. Crossover events became an annual occurrence in comics, motivated by dollar signs. However, that doesn't mean they weren't any good. Quite the contrary. X-Men had quite a few memorable multi-issue crossover events during the mid-1980s going into the mid-1990s. Fall of the Mutants, Inferno, Extinction Agenda, and Executioner's Song, to name a few. Madeline Pryor becoming the Goblin Queen unfolded in the pages of Inferno, an epic tale told for several months in Uncanny X-Men, X-Factor, and The New Mutants, with minor events spilling into other Marvel titles and the major events playing out in the three X titles. The third episode of X-Men 97, Fire Made Flesh, is a very truncated version of the story inspired by the Inferno Comics crossover. As a horror movie fan, I really enjoyed the nightmare sequences, especially Morphs, who was corrupted by Mr. Sinister in the original X-Men the Animated Series. I also like the Gambit Rogue Magneto Nightmare, a twisted version of the love triangle they're playing up. The series continues to absolutely excel at the action sequences. But my telekinetic charm extends beyond mere metal. Look at you. A villain playing dress-up as a hero. I should have you as a toy. The animated version of Inferno is just as effective at creating melodrama to tug on its audience's heartstrings. Specifically putting baby Nathan in harm's way, infecting him with a techno virus, and his parents having to give him up and send him to the future in order to save his life. A while back, way before X-Men 97, I picked up a couple of Marvel Comics trade paperback editions of X-Men 92, which was also a continuation series based on the original cartoon continuity. And back then, I thought it fit in pretty well with the 90s animated series. But X-Men 97 is on a whole new level. It's really firing on all cylinders. It's Jubilee's 18th birthday and she'd like to spend it in the arcade, but Magneto believes they should spend it in the danger room training. Frustrated, Jubilee vents to an empathetic Roberto. The duo discover a video game console called Motendo, courtesy of the slave master of Mojo World, Mojo himself. Jubilee and Roberto are sucked into the console and are subjected to dangerous reenactments of Jubilee's past exploits, including her first encounter with deadly sentinels. Whoa, where'd the mansion go? The junior X-Men are helped by an older version of Jubilee herself that is a digital copy of her from the game's beta version. Jubilee initially enjoys the blast from the past, but is convinced by her digital copy that living in the past is an empty endeavor. Together the trio defeat Mojo and Jubilee and Roberto return home. <laughs> Meanwhile, Forge has created a device that can restore Storm's powers. However, the machine seemingly fails. Forge makes a difficult confession to Storm. He reveals that he played a hand in creating the collars that restrain mutant abilities and the very technology that depowered her. The fact that his work was twisted beyond his intentions does little to sway Storm's anger. The episode is left on a cliffhanger when a demon in the form of an owl called the Adversary haunts Storm and poisons Forge. Forge's appearances on X-Men 97 don't seem to quite line up with the X-Men 92 animated series. For the most part, Forge was featured in a possible future timeline as a mentor of sorts to Bishop, but he was also seen in a present timeline as the leader of X-Factor. Professor Charles Xavier, I am Forge. That is Havoc, Multiple Man, Strong Guy, Quicksilver, Wolf's Bane. We are a mutant team recently formed under the auspices of the federal government. I guess we'll have to wait and see if this will eventually line up. The life-death portion of Episode 4 is based on a story of the same name that unfolded in the pages of Uncanny X-Men number 186 and 187. The animated version adapts the revelation that Forge is responsible for creating the tech that depowered Storm. Although the comic plays out a bit more dark, as Storm's loss of power results in the loss of her will to live. 
The classic two-issue story arc was illustrated by Barry Windsor Smith, who would go on to write and illustrate the seminal Weapon X storyline that unfolded in several issues of Marvel Comics Presents. A truncated version of the Weapon X story played out in the original 92 X-Men the Animated Series. Mojo's appearances in the original 92 X-Men cartoon was reminiscent of his appearances in the early 90s X-Men comics. Even though the character dates back to the early 1980s, his close ties to the X-Men-related character Longshot prompted a guest appearance on the original animated series also. As I was watching the Motendo portion of Episode 4, I was hoping for another Longshot appearance, or at least the first full animated appearance of Shatterstar, who's another character from Mojo World. But much to my regret, no such appearances were meant to be. However, I was pleasantly surprised with the older digital copy version of Jubilee and the sage advice she gives her much younger counterpart. I also really enjoyed Jubilee's battle with Magneto in his classic villain getup. <laughs> the 8-bit action in Mojo World was a welcome dose of nostalgia, a callback to the arcade era, specifically the X-Men 89 arcade game that my brother and I and our group of friends wasted a ton of quarters on. In my humble opinion, the Motendo story should have been a full episode. It's a lot of fun, and an extended 8-bit sequence would have been a crowd pleaser. I also think that the life-death story should have been combined with its second part, which plays out in episode 6, but I digress. We'll get there soon enough. I'm still eagerly waiting for Roberto to go full sunspot. No such luck in this episode. But they did develop his romance with Jubilee a bit more. I'm more interested in the romance between Gambit and Rogue and the third wheel, Magneto. Or the serious bump in the road Madeline Pryor put between Scott and Jean. I'm also interested in the romance between Forge and Storm, which is left unresolved so far. Besides the superhero action, these soap opera elements were what made the X-Men comics so addictive back in the day, so I'm happy to see them play it up in X-Men 97. Cyclops lets a news crew into the X-Mansion in an effort to establish a more favorable public image and strengthen mutant-human relations. In a vulnerable moment, Jean confides in Wolverine, her confusion over being not able to determine her memories from Madeline's memories. And she kisses him. Despite the torch he carries for Jean, he advises her to talk to Scott. Jean then discovers that Scott has been communicating with Madeline telepathically, and they have a heated argument all under the watchful eye of a reporter and her camera crew. Magneto, Rogue, and Gambit travel to Genosha, where the Genosian Council asks Magneto to lead the country. He agrees on the condition that Rogue lead with him. Rogue explains to Gambit that she had a secret romance with Magneto when she was younger. His magnetic field allows her to touch him without absorbing his powers or hurting him. As Rogue considers Magneto's proposal, Gambit is obviously hurt, but assures her they'll always be friends. At a gala celebrating Genosha joining the UN, Rogue kisses Magneto and realizes that she's made a terrible mistake choosing him over Gambit. Suddenly, the time-traveling Cable arrives, and Madeline realizes that he is her son, Nathan. Cable is sent back to the future before he can warn anyone of the incoming danger. An upgraded Master Mold and an army of Sentinels attack Genosha. Magneto, Rogue, and Gambit make a valiant effort to prevent total disaster. The sudden attack results in the death of thousands of mutants. Magneto is killed trying to protect his fellow X-Men, as well as a young Morlock mutant named Leech. Gambit destroys the mutant-slaying Master Mold, but makes the ultimate sacrifice in doing so. Mutant intruder neutralized. The name's Gambit, mon ami. Remember it. Remy's death leaves Rogue heartbroken. I really enjoy the soap opera type elements of the stories, which date back to the original X-Men 92 cartoon series and the X-Men comics. The love triangle between Scott, Jean, and Logan becomes a love square with Madeline in the mix. I like that Wolverine was a good friend to Jean and didn't take advantage of her vulnerable state, although when Jean confronts Scott over his telepathic communications with Madeline, she comes off a bit hypocritical after kissing Wolverine. 
Scott unloading his true feelings about human mutant relations on air was a great moment. They shouldn't have to prove themselves after saving the world hundreds of times over. Gambit and Rogue reuniting with Nightcrawler was lots of fun. For anyone in need of a refresher, per the 92 series, Nightcrawler and Rogue share the same mother, kind of. Mystique is Nightcrawler's biological mother, and she's Rogue's adopted mother. Essentially, Nightcrawler and Rogue are brother and sister, sort of. In the 92 series, Cable made quite a few appearances, but it was never revealed that he was Scott's son. So I'm glad they're exploring that here. Like I said in my review of Episode 2 when Storm lost her powers, I've read enough comics to know that it's not forever. The same can be said for the deaths of Gambit and Magneto. But that doesn't mean it wasn't pulled off effectively story-wise. I felt it, big time. Gambit first appeared in Uncanny X-Men number 266, an issue I was lucky enough to pick up at my local comic shop way back in 1990. The seminal issue introduced us to the Ragin' Cajun, Gambit, and I became an instant fan of the former thief who joined the X-Men and became a hero. The complicated romance between Gambit and Rogue in the 90s X-Men comics really touched my heart. They can't have a physical relationship because of Rogue's mutant ability that absorbs the powers and life essence of anyone she touches. The sexual tension makes for some fun interactions between the duo. The relationship between Gambit and Rogue is absolutely endearing. It goes way beyond the physical. And in my opinion, Episode 5 of X-Men 97 gets the Gambit-Rogue romance pitch perfect and plays out in a very tragic Shakespearean love story kind of way. It's an all-out war between the Shahar and the Kree empires. Surrender? No, just perish. During which, Shahar Empress Lalandra announces her engagement to Professor Charles Xavier. Deathbird refuses to accept her sister marrying a Terran, and challenges Xavier to purge all of his memories of Earth to prove his loyalty to the Shahar. Xavier reluctantly agrees, but ultimately cannot renounce his memories of his students, which results in a battle between the Shahar Imperial Guard and Deathbird's subordinates. Xavier ends the conflict by pulling everyone into the astral plane to give them an education in coexistence, a topic he's well versed in. His lesson is suddenly interrupted by a horrifying vision of Gambit's death. Xavier decides to return to Earth, choosing his responsibility to the X-Men over his responsibility to his beloved Lalandra. Meanwhile, Forge uses a book of spells to expel the demon adversary. Storm helps Forge search for a rare cactus that can cure his poisoning. Storm locates the cactus in a cave, but the adversary returns. Overcoming her fears, Storm regains her powers and defeats the demon. Elsewhere, Trask is confronted by Mr. Sinister, who warns that Genosha was only the beginning of a grand-scale plan. You have nothing to fear, so long as you place your faith in Sinister. <laughs> I'm a huge science fiction fan. Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, Star Trek, and much, much more. So I really enjoy Marvel's cosmic events and characters. I love the Star Jammers, Silver Surfer, and the original Captain Marvel. I'm in geek heaven when the X-Men have adventures in outer space. Xavier's outfit in this episode is plucked right out of one of my favorite comics, Uncanny X-Men number 275, which has an awesome gatefold cover illustrated by Jim Lee. I actually bought two copies of this issue when I was a teenager, so I could take the cover off of one and hang it on my bedroom wall like a poster. The classic cover features the X-Men all decked out in the classic first-class costumes, which Xavier makes reference to after he removes his helmet, surprising his students when revealing his face and shiny bald head. Episode 6 uses a similar reveal, but it's more for its audience because the X-Men aren't present. The 92 X-Men animated series had quite a few episodes featuring the Shahar Empire including the classic Dark Phoenix Saga episodes. Returning from the 92 series are guest appearances of personal favorites Gladiator and Deathbird. A true Kree bows to no one. The conflict that Xavier has over choosing between the X-Men, who are essentially his family, and his lover Lalandra, was compelling enough, even though we knew he would eventually choose the X-Men especially after his psychic vision of the death of Gambit. Like I said in my previous review, Gambit and Magneto's deaths aren't forever, and neither was Storm losing her powers. However, that doesn't mean these events weren't done very well. Quite the contrary. 
These events unfold in spectacular fashion, and the fact that they aren't resolved immediately within the same episode builds anticipation for their triumphant returns. The X-Men have a heartfelt funeral for Gambit, but Rogue is not in attendance. She's on a manhunt, searching for Gyrick and Trask, the duo behind the Sentinels, leaving a path of destruction wherever she goes. After gaining information from General Thunderbolt Ross and Captain America, Rogue eventually finds Gyrick and absorbs his memories. The X-Men are contacted by a terrified Trask, who tells them that he's in Madripoor. They locate a distraught Rogue and comfort her before going to Trask. Meanwhile, Roberto and Jubilee visit his mother to tell her that he's a mutant. She's unfazed by this information, but asks him to keep his identity as a mutant a secret. In Madripoor, the X-Men learn that Mr. Sinister and the UN secret OZT division have been developing a highly advanced Sentinel program. An enraged rogue drops Trask to his death. Is this who we are now? That maniac killed Remy and thousands of people on Genosha. That rotten piece of scum put a good man, my man... <laughs> Unknowingly activating programming that turns him into a human sentinel hybrid, the X-Men have their hands full trying to stop the sentinel Trask. But Cable arrives from the future and disables Trask with an EMP. Cyclops looks into Cable's eyes and realizes that he's his son, Nathan. Cable informs the X-Men that Mr. Sinister is involved, but he's working with a greater threat that must be stopped. The villainous plot is revealed to be the work of Bastion, who informs Mr. Sinister that the presumed dead Xavier is alive and that Magneto also lives and is his prisoner. Captain America also appeared on the original X-Men 92 series in a flashback episode detailing Wolverine's first encounter and team up with Cap. The episode was loosely based on another of my personal favorite comics, Uncanny X-Men number 268, illustrated by Jim Lee and written by Chris Claremont, who is responsible for a lot of the storylines that were cherry-picked for the original series as well as X-Men 97. A minor nitpick for me personally is Cap's portrayal in this episode. He's portrayed as a government lackey, which doesn't track well with the history of the character. Steve Rogers was once stripped of the mantle of Captain America by the government for not blindly following orders which led to him adapting a new superhero persona, the Captain. And John Walker, formerly Super Patriot, was given the Captain America identity. In the Civil War comic series, Captain America will not go along with the government's Superhero Registration Act, which leads to a conflict with Iron Man, who's on the opposing side of the agenda. However, the comics have also contradicted themselves with its portrayal of Cap, especially with regards to the X-Men. Different writers write characters in different ways. It's a matter of perspective. That was a long-winded way of saying the Captain America I prefer would have gotten involved and helped Rogue with more than just information. But I digress. It was still a cool cameo, and it was a great moment when Rogue threw Cap's mighty shield. <laughs> the funeral for Gambit was touching. I spotted his ex-wife Belladonna and his brother from the Guild of Thieves in attendance. The monologue delivered by Nightcrawler really nailed the essence of who Remy was as a person. Haunted by the life, a sinner beyond saving. I think he was bluffing. Failed to see how his sins had made him into a hero. Every gambler was gambits. The brother-sister moment that Rogue shared with Nightcrawler really pulled at my heartstrings. Speaking of Nightcrawler, his inclusion on the team is absolutely delightful. Despite having every reason to hate mankind for the way they've treated him because of his appearance, Nightcrawler maintains such a positive outlook of the world. He's a great character that I especially have fond memories of from his exploits in the Excalibur Marvel comics. Rogue's quest for vengeance was an awesome display of her powers. She destroys a military installation that was meant to withstand an attack from the Incredible Hulk. Most impressive. The X-Men in Genosha and witnessing the aftermath of the Sentinel attack was really well done. The moment when they found the survivor, Emma Frost, gave a glimmer of hope. The original X-Men the Animated Series did an extremely good job of establishing the ongoing struggle between mankind and mutant kind and the threat of all-out war. And X-Men 97 continues that tradition while upping the stakes considerably. So far, the series has been an emotional roller coaster, and I've really been enjoying the ride. 
the allegory for racism and persecution mutants are subjected to that's prevalent in the X-Men Marvel comics and the original 90s animated series intensely permeates within X-Men 97. Those steps have been taken to bring Xavier's dream of peaceful coexistence to beautiful fruition. Unfortunately, equal measures have been implemented to sabotage his dream. The stakes have been raised considerably concerning the threat of all-out war between humankind and mutantkind, and the stage has been set for an epic finale. Tensions run high within the X-Mansion's conference room, when the UN reveals to the world that Xavier is alive, which incites an anti-mutant protest outside Xavier's school. Cable explains to the X-Men that the Genosha massacre is a point in time that's absolute, that cannot be altered. Bastion will use this point in time to start a 300-year war that will lead to the enslavement of all mutants in a human utopia. Cyclops, Gene, and Cable learn that Bastion is a human-sentinel hybrid who was conceived after his father was infected by a time-traveling sentinel called Nimrod. Bastion is turning humans into prime sentinels using Mr. Sinister's techno-organic virus. Prime sentinels activate all over the world and begin attacking mutants. In the course of the battle, Xavier's school is burnt to the ground. A horrified sympathizer, Dr. Val Cooper, frees Magneto, who then uses his power to create a massive EMP, resulting in a worldwide blackout. Though his actions shut down all the Prime Sentinels, it causes much chaos. Wolverine fears that Magneto has declared war, just as Xavier returns and summons his X-Men. To me, my X-Men. The X-Men rallying to a comatose rogue's bedside after she was sidelined by Sentinel Prime Trask was especially well done. It gave a bit of time for a special moment to be shared between Jean and Nightcrawler, who got to know Jean's clone Madeline on Genosha. I like that Nightcrawler was able to provide Jean with some sage advice concerning her shared memories with Madeline, which seemed to bring her a bit of peace on the matter. We've gotten to see cameos from other heroes on the series consistently through Morph's ability to change. But it was kind of cool to see actual cameos from Doctor Doom, Baron Zemo, Silver Samurai, Omega Red, and the always amazing, sometimes spectacular Spider-Man. Cameos for cameos sake was a little something the original 92 X-Men series did as well. I want Doctor Doom vs. the X-Men. It would be an awesome episode and a great callback to personal favorites Uncanny X-Men number 145 through 147. It was cool to finally see Roberto go full sunspot as he rescues Jubilee from an onslaught of Prime Sentinels. He's been secretly training in the Danger Room, which was a good thing because he was useless in a fight up to this point. Unfortunately for him, his mother shows her true colors when she sells him out to protect her social status. Meu filho, do what the men say. The action sequences in the series increasingly excel. The scene when Wolverine and Nightcrawler protect Rogue from hordes of Prime Sentinels was a fanboy's wet dream come true. The ferocity of Wolverine and the swashbuckling swagger of Nightcrawler was exhilarating to say the least. Equally exhilarating was the escape from the Blackbird's destruction at the hands of Prime Sentinels via Cyclops' Porsche. <laughs> Team Summers in action is just one example of what a great character Cyclops is and what a huge mistake the Fox X-Men films made by underutilizing him. Gene being overprotective and treating Cable like a kid was a fun touch as well. Nathan, get in the back! Quit bossing me around! The last minute of the episode when Professor X returns to Earth and his destroyed school was awesome. I absolutely loved the callback to the first episode. To me, my X-Men. <laughs> to me, my X-Men. It's also a reference to the very first issue of X-Men written by Stan Lee and illustrated by Jack Kirby in the early 1960s. On the very first page, we are introduced to the X-Men as Xavier summons them to his side telepathically. 
X-Men 97 continues to be a heartfelt, meaningful action extravaganza, and part one of Tolerance is Extinction excellently sets up its three-part finale. Xavier is met with some distrust upon his return, but the X-Men focus on stopping Bastion, and they try to convince Magneto to use his power to reverse the blackout. Magneto refuses to help and rejects Xavier's dream, but he invites the X-Men to join him on his mutant haven, Asteroid M. Only Rogue and Sunspot accept his invitation. The rest of the X-Men return to their former base on Muir Island to regroup, before splitting up into two teams. Cyclops' blue team goes to Asteroid M to confront Magneto, while Storm and Jean's gold team head to Bastion's hideout. My X-Men and I are your best hope to avoid that future. If you're wrong, Xavier, my hand will be forced. We have been here before, President Kelly. If you don't trust me, trust my X-Men. The gold team battles an army of Bastion's controlled sentinels, as well as Sinister, who takes control of Cable's mind and uses him to attack Jean. She tries to get through to Cable as a mother figure, but he is unable to break Sinister's control. Meanwhile, on Asteroid M, Xavier attempts to take control of Magneto's mind, but his helmet protects him from any psychic assault. Eventually, Magneto's helmet is removed, and Wolverine seizes the opportunity, stabbing and seriously wounding him. Magneto retaliates by ripping the adamantium metal from Wolverine's skeleton. Right off the bat, Storm's reunion with the X-Men was heartwarming, and she looks great in her old 70s, 80s costume. The father-son tension between Charles and Scott was completely relatable. Rogue snapping out of her coma with Nightcrawler at her bedside was also well done. These tender moments just before an epic battle perfectly establishes a genuine sense of family. Make them mind your weather, sister. And them weather your mind. It was understandable why both Rogue and Sunspot choose to side with Magneto. But we all know that ultimately they won't really betray their surrogate family. But that doesn't diminish the dramatic stakes at all. I always dislike this joke in the Fox X-Men films. You actually go outside in these things? What would you prefer? Yellow spandex? So I'm glad this episode reverses the joke back on them. <laughs> Am I going to war or a circus? What'd you expect? Black leather? It only took over 20 years to get Wolverine in a version of his proper costume on the big screen in Deadpool and Wolverine. The new slash old costumes was a cool throwback to the X-Men comics. Although honestly, I prefer Wolverine in the yellow and blue over the brown costume. With the team in these versions of their costumes and a battle on Asteroid M, I got strong Pride of the X-Men vibes. X -Men, X -Men, I really enjoy the X-Men working as a team, using their powers in unison, playing off each other. Morph transforming into one of my all-time favorite Marvel superheroes, the Incredible Hulk, was absolutely awesome. Both battles on Earth and on Asteroid M were equally epic, but the showstopper was Magneto ripping the adamantium from Wolverine's skeleton. Been in a lot of wars, Bob. The brave always die first. This is a callback to a quote from Magneto. Heroic fools. Brave are always the first to die. The battle on Asteroid M was plucked out of another personal favorite X-Men comic, number 25, in which Wolverine and Magneto have a very similar confrontation. But not to worry, Wolverine's healing factor will do what it does best, and old Wolvie will be back doing what he does best, just without his trademark adamantium. Although I do have to say, in both the comics and cartoon, it seems a bit short-sighted strategically to send a guy with bones laced with metal up against a master of magnetism. In some circumstances, you have no choice. But in this case, they split the X-Men into two teams. Wolverine could have stayed on Earth with the gold team. But that's just a minor nitpick. It's still a great idea, which demonstrates the willingness to feature more realistic consequences of an all-out battle. Even if the consequences are only temporary, the road back is all part of the fun.
Xavier seizes control over Magneto and restores power to Earth, but fractures Magneto's mind in the process. Jean connects with the dormant cosmic power of the Phoenix within her. She forces the restraining collar created by Beast and Forge onto Bastion, restoring the Prime Sentinel's humanity, and reverses Sinister's mutant augmentation, which frees his control over Cable. The X-Men try to reason with the techno-evolved Bastion, but they face an unrelenting foe. The X-Men then fight to stop Bastion from crashing Asteroid M into Earth. The U.S. government launches missiles at the asteroid hoping to destroy it, but the missiles are unsuccessful. Xavier diligently, desperately works to restore Magneto's fractured psyche. Eventually, Charles gets through to Magneto, and he regains consciousness. Back at full power, Magneto sends the asteroid back into space, but Asteroid M unexpectedly explodes, and most of the X-Men are presumed dead. Six months later, Bishop arrives to tell Forge that the X-Men are actually trapped in time. Cyclops and Jean are in a desolate future, where they encounter Mother Ascani and a young Nathan, while Rogue, Nightcrawler, Beast, Xavier, and Magneto end up in ancient Egypt, where they meet Ansabanur, a young version of one of the X-Men's deadliest foes, Apocalypse. In a mid credit scene, present-day Apocalypse finds one of Gambit's playing cards in the ruins of Genosha. What a great climactic end to an epic 10 episodes. Tons of fantastic action, intense drama, peppered with more fun cameos. So many cameos. I was happy to see Cloak and Dagger and Alpha Flight with Psylocke, a few of my personal favorites. The return of the Phoenix was really awesome. I love that Jean embraced her shared memories with Madeline and that she accepts Cable as her son. I enjoyed seeing Cyclops whisper words of encouragement to Wolverine as he's laid up. Morph also had some words of encouragement for his buddy disguised as Jean. I love you, Logan. Stay with me. Scott and Jean thinking this could be their last mission saying goodbye to their son Nathan was also really good. Every character gets a moment to shine, not only in an action set piece, but with such great dialogue and meaningful character development. I really enjoyed how Magneto flip-flops from X-Men ally to enemy to ally again, and his latest change of heart helped save the day. It was great to see him and Charles work together on the same side. It will be interesting to see how this all plays out in Season 2. It was also a satisfying moment for Morph to see Mr. Sinister humiliated and defeated. I assume by the mid-credits tease that maybe Gambit will be resurrected by Apocalypse, and maybe Remy will return as a villain temporarily. So much was left open for Season 2, and I for one can't wait. The majority of X-Men 97 was written by Bo DeMeo, and he did a spectacular job respecting the original series and creating a genuine, legit continuation. Original series producer Larry Houston and writers Eric and Julia Leewald return as creative consultants. And as mentioned in my review of Episode 1, most of the voice actors from the original series also return to reprise their respective roles. Keeping the architects of the original series involved is really commendable. This was a series revival done extremely well. Though the 92 series did a great job of adapting mature storylines from the X-Men comics, there was only so much a Saturday morning platform would allow. X-Men 97 has no such restrictions, and pushes it to the limit, but manages to stay in line, so it's also accessible to a younger audience. I really enjoyed the entirety of Season 1. I often judge a series on how rewatchable it is. And I've rewatched X-Men 97 several times. And I'm not tired of it at all. I obviously highly recommend it. Thanks so much for letting your geek flags fly with Mad About Superheroes. 